Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you for Jacob. Me. Yeah, you don't know what a pleasure it is to see you there, a human being, as opposed to a face <laughs> on, a, on a Zoom screen. It, it is it's, nice to be getting back to normal, isn't it? So it is. We're not far off now. Look, so, Jacob, levelling up, such a big theme in this Queen's speech, which sounds attractive in principle. If it works politically, it is a route to four more years, at least, who knows, maybe more. Now, part of that is about skilling and training of people in those left-behind areas of, of the country, and especially reaching out to people who are not one of the 50% who go on to higher education now. Now, tell me, when it comes to, to that, that's a mission which is, I think, on any analysis, worth, worth doing. But do you believe 50% going into higher education, is that... Is that a good figure? Do you, do you support that proportion? Or would you argue maybe that it would be arguably a better thing if more people went directly into the world of work? Uh, I think it's not about a specific figure. It's about people doing the thing that is right for them. I do think that education is good in itself. I think there is um, an enrichment of society that you get from having the availability of good um, education. But I'm actually really pleased and excited by the skills bill and the approach to lifelong learning because in my own constituency I've got the former Somerset Coalfields and they last closed in one in 1974 so it's a long time ago but those areas have had pockets of deprivation where education was to some extent left behind and the Radstock College went into a merger with the Bath College. Its standards are really going up and it's about providing opportunities for people um, who need extra skills and this is where levelling up will be tested that do the people not not have you built lots of roads lots of roads will be important and railways and all of that yeah. but it's do people have the skills they need to do the jobs that are available mm. and if the UK is going to compete globally if we're going to earn our living we're going to need people to have those extra skills so I, I, I think the lifelong learning loan getting people those better skills, giving people a second chance if they've been passed by when yes. they were younger is really exciting. So we're looking um, in the future under this plan to our further education colleges and institutions to deliver a much more highly skilled workplace and to do that in, in areas which, as I say, we described as being left behind for very good reason. Does that mean that the, the 10 years of austerity we've had, undeniably over the past 10 years, under Conservative administrations, Conservative-led administrations, was that all a mistake? Because further education has been hit so hard over the last 10 years. No, I think austerity was absolutely essential, that the country had run out of money effectively by 2010, and that if we hadn't had austerity, we wouldn't have been able to have the response to the pandemic that we have had that has kept the structures of the economy going, that the furlough scheme, the business bailout loans, all of that have been affordable because of the fiscal base that we had a year ago, if we had been running deficits of £150 billion a year from 2010 through to 2020, it's inconceivable that we could have done that, even if they'd been a little bit lower. So fiscal responsibility has allowed us to respond to the pandemic, has allowed us to protect the structures of the economy and jobs. And now it's about, to use the slogan, building back better, mm. to ensure that people are given more uh, opportunities and better opportunities... And in terms of higher education and further education, it's not all about money. It's about, are these organisations well run? And, uh, and in, as I say, in my own constituency, Bath College taking over the Radstock College has dramatically improved the standards in the Radstock College without spending huge amounts of extra money. Yeah, but are, are you really saying, when you say that, uh, Jacob, that a cut of a third in, in, in sixth forms and higher education between... 2009 and 2019, that was an absolutely necessary prerequisite for the response to the pandemic that we've seen? If we hadn't had a solid fiscal situation a year ago, we would not have been able to afford the furlough scheme and the other schemes that have protected the structures of the economy. And then all the very gloomy forecasts that we had a year ago about how high unemployment could have risen would have come to fruition and probably more so. So the protection of the structures of the economy has depended upon sound finances, which was the work of the previous 10 years. Mm -hmm. And there will be work to do in future to get the finances uh, into a sound state, mm -hmm. and that, of course, was part of the Queen's speech so as not, well. So not just no regrets about that austerity, but you absolutely welcome and support and salute the fact that that's what happened. It's allowed the success uh, of preserving jobs during the pandemic that... Governments have to cut their coat according to their cloth, and we were cutting a coat for which we didn't have the cloth in 2010. Mm. So look, we're now looking to 
build a, a fund, a reservoir, a pool of skills for the British economy in the future, and especially in the, the post-Brexit world. When it comes to that, the wider culture of work in this country, do you think the, the British work ethic needs in, in, in various ways to be improved? You would have heard, as, as we've all heard, people who run restaurants, hotels, bars, people who have farms, complaining they, they cannot get homegrown British workers for those businesses, especially now so many overseas workers have left over Brexit during the, the pandemic. Do we need a new work ethic there, Jacob? Should people be, to put it crudely, less picky about the work they do? I think there's a very strong work ethic in this country. I, I think the idea that British people aren't willing to work is proved to be false. What about day those farmers in, and those restaurants out. who say just that? Well, it's not quite what they say. It's that there have been certain skill sets that people who have come in uh, from overseas and have become very specialist in particular areas have been extremely good at. And um, harvesting crops is a very skilled job. And the more you do it, the faster you become at it. So it's not purely an issue of hours worked. Uh, it's a question of whether you have been doing it well enough. But our society wants to have good, well-paying jobs, surely. That must be the aim. And improving the education level will put people into better-paid jobs. And we also need to be looking at and developing the technologies that will do some of these jobs that were being done uh, by people coming in from overseas. Now, one of the benefits of, of improving our collective skill set is an improvement in British productivity and the productivity of the British economy. And the, the disparities in levels of productivity between regions is quite enormous. Between London, Yorkshire and Humberside, the North East and so on, there's a huge, huge gap. Is that something it is possible to, to level up, do you think, over a realistic time frame? It's a very interesting, important question. It's one that's been puzzling UK economists for the last 20 years, probably, the, the conundrum of um, the UK economy growing but productivity not seeming to, and trying to understand what the causes of that have been. Now, I'm not sure there are actually any very clear answers as to what the cause of the productivity gap has been, and not just between uh, regions of this country, but between this country and some of our competitors. I'm sure that education is part of it. That seems to me to be a logical likelihood, and therefore improving educational opportunities... And skills. I mean, and that skills. is clearly a, a problem. <clears throat> I, sorry, sorry, I included that in education. So skills education as well as academic education. Um, improving that and crucially giving people a second chance so, so that if, for whatever reason, their education when they were younger didn't work particularly well, and this is what the lifelong learning loan will do, mm. will allow people to come back to gain the skills they need to, to compete in the current marketplace. Yeah. I think that it's fundamentally important because I also believe you want to try and give people a second chance. You know, if people have been left behind because government policy in the past failed them, surely it's morally right to try and help them have a second so chance. If we're going to achieve that kind of levelling up, it is, I suppose, logically, the work of many, many years. It is an enormous task and will take many, many years. Certainly the greater than the span of a single parliament. You're not going to get a, an election dividend out of that. But let me just stick with the question of timing for, for a moment. And you, Jacob, you famously said, didn't you, that it could take 50 years to see the benefits of Brexit show themselves. Now we've been through a pandemic. We've had a loss of 10% in, in economic growth. Have you revised that judgment now? Do you think it no, could no, take longer? I'm, I'm sorry to say you're misquoting me. But unlike you, actually, uh, you? I said over 50 years, not after 50 years, that it would be a process yes. rather than you see the benefit immediately. Actually, we've begun to see benefits straight away and faster uh, than I think many people expected. But you're absolutely right to say that policy decisions are long-term. I think some of the important economic changes made in the 1980s were still being felt in the early 2000s, that all policy decisions have long gestation periods. But that's not a reason not to make those policy decisions. Indeed, it makes it even more urgent to get on with them so that the benefits begin to come through um, as soon as is possible. Yes. But recognising that the ship of state is an aircraft carrier yeah. uh, rather than a little dinghy. Well, Jacob, I'm, I'm a great believer in accuracy. I mean, your, your, your exact quote, it was on a Channel 4 interview, you'll remember very well, was we won't know the full economic consequences for a very long time. The overwhelming opportunity, as you remind us, for Brexit is over the next 50 years, which clearly means a period of up to 50, 50 years. Yes, but that's exactly, that's exactly what I was saying. We you will see, see the benefits earlier than that. We sure. will see the benefits over 50 years, but that doesn't mean 
after 50 years. You don't have to wait 50 years for the benefits. Yeah. No, let me, let me, in that same context of timelines, let me ask you about health. We have a quite frightening waiting list for the NHS now. 4.7 million people, 400,000 people waiting for treatment now longer than a year. But you're going to have to be honest with the public about this, aren't you, and tell us uh, that long waiting lists for treatment, for reasons we, in many cases we quite understand, but they're with us now for a very long time. Well, there is going to be very significant continued extra spending in the NHS to try and tackle this. But you're right to highlight this as a problem. Uh, There will be a health service bill to try and um, pick up on some of the events that have happened over the last year to understand how the health service uh, can operate even more effectively. That's done a fantastic job over the last year. Um, But yes, money will be dedicated to this. Um, Expertise will be needed. But I don't think anyone's denying that it will take time to catch up with the effects of of COVID. Yeah, there's an NHS bill in the Queen's speech. There's no social care bill as such for the funding of social care. Although the Prime Minister, I don't know how often you've been reminded of this just today, has told us when he came into office, there was, I'm quoting now, a clear plan that we have prepared. Well, there was no such clear plan, was there? Why Why did he say that? Well, bear in mind that when the Prime Minister came into office, there was no majority, so the ability to get things through was non-existent. There was an adult parliament, mm. one of the worst parliaments in But if you had a clear plan then, history, with no We, we couldn't have got it through. Well, you couldn't no. have got anything well, through Well, you could now, point. and it's not we even then, in the Queen's hold, speech. Hold on, we then had a general election, um, and then within two or three months of general election, we've had a pandemic. Uh, what was said at the last Queen's speech was that the government would seek to get cross-party support for a plan for improving uh, the funding of social care. Yes. Uh, that there has essentially been a period of a year where policy development of that kind has not been practical because the energy, the effort, has been on dealing with the pandemic. But um, the Queen's speech did refer to social care and the health and social care bill will deal with integrating health and social care better so that the two work together Mm. more effectively. Mm. Um, But yes, the government is committed uh, to bringing forward a detailed funding plan as well, by the end of the year. By the end of the year. Let me me put this to you, another political point. You wouldn't be human and you certainly wouldn't be a politician if you weren't taking some comfort from the condition of the Labour Party right now and of Keir Starmer. Labour is accused and rather admits that it's not been in tune with the British working class. Do you feel that you are now the workers' party? Do you feel you, Jacob, are now in tune with the British working class? I mean, what, for example, to illustrate this, what do you have in common, Jacob, with an unskilled or a semi-skilled worker in Hartlepool? Well, the Conservative Party, and particularly the Brexiteers within the Conservative Party, recognised that the country at large wanted to govern itself and believed that the votes of people up and down the country were of equal worth. The trap the Labour Party fell into was saying that about half its voters were stupid and not being willing to pull back from that after the country had voted to leave the European Union. Indeed, spending the 2017-2019 Parliament, led by Sir Keir Starmer as the Brexit uh, spokesman, um, uh, trying to thwart the will of the British people. So, of course, their voters are um, fed up with them to that extent. Uh, that It's not a good political strategy to tell your voters that you think they're stupid. So, in that sense, Jacob, you feel you are more of a political soulmate to an unskilled worker in Hartlepool than anyone on the Labour shadow cabinet. I believe in the value of their vote being of equal worth to my own vote. I believe in their value as an individual because the Conservative Party is a party that believes in the individual and doesn't believe in a top-down direct direction of the mass of the British people. Yes. So I think the Conservative Party is in touch. I'm not trying to personalise it to me because it's more interesting, I think, to look at the party... Uh, as a whole, the party is in touch with the great British people because it understands what their concerns are and responds to them, whereas the Labour Party thinks that they should have different concerns. It says um, the aim is to change the electorate rather than to change their policies. Last one, very briefly, if I, if I may, very briefly, and, and thank you for taking time to especially come into the studio, but the Prime Minister mentioned in the course of his, I think, a reply to Keir Starmer, uh, that there would be an inquiry into the handling of the COVID pandemic in the course of this session, which came, I think, as news uh, to most of us, and quite, a, and quite a big commitment. Well, it's always been obvious that there would have to be an inquiry into COVID, into what has happened, uh, what has been handled well, what could have been handled better, what the preparedness was for uh, a pandemic. It's obvious that that would happen. It will happen at a point when there is... Um, the ability to do it when the pandemic is behind us rather than when dealing with the pandemic is taking up most of the political energy of the nation. 
All right, Jacob Rees-Mogg, lovely to talk to you. My pleasure, thank, thank you. for you. coming in. I'll let you go now. Your, your advisors are giving us dirty looks through the glass. So, oh, they, they shouldn't. They, they should be smiling they, benignantly be smiling. at you. <laughs> Have a good afternoon. Thank Take you. care.